everybody. Thank you so much for joining another episode of Crypto Café. Uh, you're here with uh, Phil Brockers in your favorite tavern. And today I have uh, two of the usual suspects, uh, Malman and Kiko. Say hello to everybody. Hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> It's good to hear you. Your voice is in English, babies. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Very nice. Um, so uh, today, uh, Kiko is, uh, is will join us soon, I, I hope. Um, but uh, meanwhile, let me introduce our guest uh, for today, Kevin. Uh, how are you doing, buddy? Welcome to the show. Thanks. Yeah, I'm doing great. Good, good. I know that. Uh, I mean, I know that you've been living in Portugal for a while. Now you're in the Azores, in Terceira, uh, and we, we were speaking a little bit earlier, and they were complaining that the, the weather was not that good today. Hopefully, tomorrow will get better. But uh, how 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 have you been enjoying the Azores for now, Terceira? How long have you been there? Um, so it's my second time here, and uh, I think we yeah we landed on on Sunday, so it's been two days. Uh, we haven't been here for very long this time, uh, but it's great. Um, we are staying in a in a really nice Airbnb in Quatre Ribeiras, so in the north of Terceira. Okay. And uh, yeah, really really cool place. It's like a very old uh, quinta, you know, type building, like very old, uh, big mansion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really cool. Like it, it's just it's hard to explain how cool it is. We, there is even a swimming pool and stuff. Of course, we're not using it because it's too cold right now. <laughs> But uh, yeah, definitely a place I would recommend uh, if uh, if someone wants to go to to Terceira. Um, you, uh, you have a fireplace, man. Yeah, I have a fireplace. Like we have a fireplace. So just behind me, there is now a, a fire, <laughs> or at least we're starting a fire. Uh, but yeah, it's really, really enjoyable. It's really out of uh, my usual, uh, my usual like like day life, you know. That's good, man. And uh, we also have another surprise guest, uh, another team member of uh, Revolt. Do you want to introduce uh, Antoine? Hi, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm Antoine. So I'm co-founder of Revolt with Kevin, and I'm here with Tilsa as well. Nice. That's good. That's good. Another uh, surprise guest. That's how we like it. That's how we do it here in the Crypto Cafe. Um, Kevin, you've been living in Portugal for uh, quite some time now, since 2016. Wait, 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 wait. We yeah. have another guest, man. Oh, yeah? Some yeah, yeah. Now? Rick was in the house. <laughs> Hello, <Ooh>. everyone. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Hi, Rick was. The beginning. Nice. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, okay, man. Hello, Kevin. Long time no talk. How are hey, you? Hey, how are you? Oh, good. Okay, you can continue, man. Yeah, let's go. That, let's go. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, um, so basically, we've been living in Portugal for uh, quite some time since 2016. Um, I mean, why did you decide to, to come to Portugal? Any specific reason? Ah, um, all right. So, I was living in Dublin, um, in Ireland before, mm -hmm. uh, for a long time. And uh, yeah, Dublin is great for business. But it's also always gray, and you never see the blue sky. And so <laughs> after after some time, you know, you just have enough of it, and you just want to see color again. See that? Um, so I just decided to move, and I wanted to go somewhere, you know, south. Um, so I went to see a few different places uh, in Europe because I didn't really want to to leave Europe either. So I went to Greece. I went to different places in Spain, and to Portugal for the first time, actually. And uh, yeah, I really loved it. Uh, it was just amazing. And um, it also happens that the first time I came to Portugal to view it was the, the first time you had the Web Summit here, um, which is funny because the Web Summit is, you know, coming from Dublin. So it was the first year they were out of Dublin and I kind of followed them. Uh, but that was not the, that was not the reason why I was here. But it was like kind of funny that I could uh, I could see a lot of people that I were meeting every day. I was meeting every day in Dublin and they were in Portugal at the same time. So yeah, I just picked Portugal because it was the one that you know I loved the most, and uh, I'm absolutely, uh, I'm absolutely not regretting my choice. It's a, it's a great place to be. Good to know, man. Good to know. I'm glad that you were uh, enjoying your stay here, man. And um, you know, but what if, what what have you been like, you know, doing before you know you you came into to the Bitcoin space? Um, like uh, what 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 you're working on? What what did you study before? You know, you you find Bitcoin. Um, yeah, so I did study nanotechnologies, um, which is, you know, very niche and, uh, upcoming stuff. Um, but yeah, so I'm basically, I studied uh, theoretical physics, right? No, applied physics, sorry. 
um, in the nanotechnology field. And um, I was like finishing my studies and then um, kind of like, you know, what can I do with it? I'm really into applied sciences and uh, even like applied, you know, quantum physics doesn't really make sense, at least uh, unless you have a very, very specific job. And so, yeah, I just uh, decided to look into different type of stuff. I really love electronics, so I started working on some electronic stuff. Um, and one of the things I started working on was a new way of uh, doing contactless payments. Okay. And so worked on a prototype. It worked fine. It was really cool. Um, went to see some investors to try to see if, you know, there would be some traction or whatever, some interest. And they just told me about bank licenses and all of these, you know, weird regulations around payment methods that I had no clue about um, and how difficult <laughs> it is to launch into, you know, a fintech business. Um, and so, you know, I was really, you know, down. I was like, fuck, it, it's just killing my business just because of stupid regulations. Um, and actually, a Bitcoin startup um, learned about my project and they contacted me and they were like, hey, Kevin, you know, do you know about Bitcoin? And I was like, I mean, I've heard of it, but I have no clue what it is and how is this even relevant? And they were like, well, you know, there is absolutely no regulation in this thing. You can do payments and you don't care about asking permission to anybody. And so that's just how I started learning um, about Bitcoin and, you know, just deep dived into it. And uh, after like a week, I was already full time on Bitcoin. So, yeah, <laughs> it, was just, uh, it was just a really you know, trigger for me. Um, there was no learning period. It was like, I went all in from the very beginning in terms of uh, my time, at least not my money, because I was broke, but hey. <laughs> not the wormhole, right? <laughs> exactly. And uh, by the way, I'm curious, Riklis, how did you meet Kevin? Because uh, it sounded like you already you already know him. Yeah, we have already met before. Uh, let's just say when Kevin came to Lisbon, uh, he needed someone to trade with, and I was there. That's how we <laughs> met, basically. Nice. That's that's uh, actually quite interesting. Yeah, uh, that's basically, pretty cool. It, it was running. Do you still run the the cafe? Uh, it still exists. Yes. So I'm somewhat running it, but uh, yeah, it's really not my focus <laughs> uh, in terms of my of my time right now. Sure. But yes, it's still there. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Cool. Yeah, the, and we had another pastime in common, but not very relevant. Uh, okay. And that's basically it. We just uh, met through Bitcoin for trading. And uh, also, I had already uh, met Kevin, but not really talked much with him before uh, on building on Bitcoin, which okay. was the first conference we had here. And he was the organizer, so kudos to that. It was really nice, a really nice conference, and uh, yeah, we uh, actually we actually only met after that. Bitcoin connecting people. <laughs> Not for sure. I mean, right <laughs> yeah, a lot of interesting people were at the conference, so uh, it it was really nice. Yeah, man. Well done, Kevin. I think it was it's it's fun that you you had to come to Portugal to organize the first conference. It's it's actually quite uh, quite interesting, man. But uh, congratulations, honestly, man, because uh, yeah. That, that yeah, that's very good for the space here in Portugal. The conference was really great. I think um, I was you know a little bit disappointed that we, we didn't have a lot of Portuguese people attending, mm -hmm. um, especially given the quality of the attendees and stuff. You know, like this is this was at the time like the biggest Bitcoin conference uh, ever. <laughs> Yeah, and so especially in terms of like developers and you know basically all the core devs were here. It was really something big. Um, sadly, it kind of went um, you know unseen by the local scene, I think. Um, but hey, um, it was there. Uh, a lot of people now come to Portugal because they just discovered it from the conference. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll yeah, risk saying at the time the scene was not that developed, in my opinion, unless you got a different opinion, but. From what I knew at the time, I don't think it was very developed. And uh, I guess the people that I know now that were already in the scene, they could have gone if they knew about it. But I don't know. I mean, that's all guessing. At this yeah, point. I didn't know when uh, when was the the conference. What which year? Two thousand eighteen. Yeah. Yeah, twenty eighteen. Okay. Okay. I missed it. Yeah, me too. Never heard about it at the time, I think. Yeah. 
I'm Super. sorry, man. Next time yeah. we all go with Crypto Cafe. All <laughs> people listen to us. We all go and we join you. Please make more conferences. Yeah. Well, you can you can still watch the recordings on YouTube. They are still there. So. Nice, nice, <laughs> very yeah. nice. I will oh, way, take a look. That, we we're gonna yeah. put the the links in the description. Definitely, yeah, definitely of the conference, yeah. and um, and also of some of your uh, of your talks, if you don't mind, because uh, Kevin has a couple of brilliant talks that are available on YouTube. At least I, I do, I do, you know, recommend them. They're quite fun to watch, especially the Proof of Moon one. That that's a very fun one. <laughs> um, uh, but anyways, man. So basically, so um, you were, I mean, we're already talking about your period in Bitcoin, but. Uh, um, you started Bitcoin. You went like you know, um, you know, you just dove, dove deep basically into into Bitcoin. Um, and uh, you, you before you started the uh, revolt, you started change mix, correct? Um, so how yeah. did like you know how did both ideas come up to be? You know how did wh when did you have those ideas and uh, when did you start developing the projects? All right. So my first uh, Bitcoin startup was called Signature. Um, mm -hmm. I co-founded it with another guy called uh, Alex Perixazi. Okay. Uh, who is now actually a core dev on Ethereum, so very, very different mindset. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, what we were working on was a uh, hardware, some kind of a hardware wallet. Um, but at the time, you know, there was no hardware wallet. It was before Trezor, so um, very, very early. Okay, and, when was uh, it, more or less? Do you have any idea? It, yeah, it, it was 2013. Um, okay. And so we were working on a way for people to safe keep their Bitcoin very long term um, mm -hmm. in a way where they cannot you know, really do mistakes, so they cannot really lose it. Okay. And uh, it was based on hardware, but it was very far from what would be considered a very minimum hardware wallet today. So it didn't even have a screen, it didn't have buttons, um, so that would absolutely not work today in terms of security. <laughs> okay. um, but still, it was really cool as an idea. The problems were around supply chain, there was really low demand, and the cost of producing hardware is really high, so we burnt a lot of money and pretty much, you know, went bust. <laughs> um, but uh, but doing this, I had the chance to meet, you know, a lot of people in the Bitcoin space. Um, I really, like, that's really how I started meeting, you know, with core devs and other tech people. Um, so really, I don't regret these, uh, these years. And um, afterwards, we just decided, you know, um, Alex and I decided to um, split the business in like two different things because he wanted to explore some things um, around card payments in, in Bitcoin and I was not too interested so um, I was like well dude I'm gonna start you know the consulting business and that's how I uh, I, I, I started the uh, change okay. so Chainsmith was basically at the time just a consultancy because I had some knowledge of Bitcoin and I knew a lot of um, really 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 knowledgeable people in, in the Bitcoin space much more than me um, and I was like, hey, guys, uh, let's wait until, you know, the market is a bit more mature. Um, and in the meantime, we can just sell, you know, expertise, basically. Um, and it was a really good timing um, because we started Chainsmith in 2015. And that's really exactly the time where people started talking about, you know, blockchain is a new thing. Um, mm -hmm. that, was, that was just basically before Ethereum launched and stuff. So it was still Bitcoin at the time. And uh, and yeah, like. Really good years. Um, it let us work with companies like, you know, MasterCard, um, Bank of Ireland, you know, very, very big corporations. Um, and it was really fun because we were like a very, very young team of uh, just guys that love Bitcoin. And we were invited to talk to like board of director in global <laughs> banks. And that was like super interesting. <laughs> but uh, yeah. And so through Chainsmith, you know, I get access to some problems that people have um, and they need consistency <clears throat> for. And uh, that's kind of how also Revolt got, you know, born. Um, we got a, a hedge fund that was uh, facing a problem about how to custody their Bitcoin, and they didn't want to use a third party. And they were like, um, "Hey guys, can like can we actually do Bitcoin custody in a multi-party environment without using third parties?" And I was like, "Well, I don't know. I like we can do some research on it." And um, so they basically paid for quite a bit of research um, that we put together and we found a way to somewhat, you know, emulate a covenant. Uh, we can talk about covenants if you want. Uh, so basically, sure. basically lock, uh, like lock some Bitcoins to a specific set of conditions so they cannot be spent if they don't respect a, a list of different conditions. Mm -hmm. um, but Bitcoin is really basic in terms of scripting. So you can't, you know, you can't really put complex stuff in Bitcoin. Well, I mean, you can, but it's, it's not really built for that. 
Um, so we found a way to do what they wanted, um, which is really cool, and that's what we call Revolt. And uh, the next step is to actually build the whole thing because it's somewhat a new layer. Uh, it requires a lot of work. It's a security thing, so it can't be done as a proof of concept. And so that's how we started Revolt, the business, the company. And uh, yeah, that's where I am right now. That's good, man. So basically, when Revolt started, you already had, uh, you know, uh, some investors interested in developing a product around, um, you know, uh, external, well, a custody, but not uh, with an external third party. Um, yeah, and we already had a client, basically. Yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, but, but I mean, how, how how do you guys, I mean, how do you guys, for example, compare to, uh, you know, Unchained Capital? Um, uh, because, you know, or, or any other, any other, like, you know, uh, solution that tries to, to, you know, to secure Bitcoin through multisig. Yeah, so multisig is a somewhat okay solution, um, but it really depends on how it's implemented. And also to make multisig secure, it completely kills the usability um, of the wallet itself. So okay. if you want, let's say, to secure a lot of money, like let's talk about corporations, right? So let's say you are a corporation, you have hundreds of millions of Bitcoin, but well, worse of Bitcoin, <laughs> um, and uh, and you need to secure them. Um, you don't really want one guy to have all the control and be able to spend it all. You want you know multiple people to have to check and everything. It's fine if it's just very long term holding and you want to have a multi sig with like you know five out of five, and uh, it will happen. You know maybe they will we, they will meet one time per year to do some spending. Um, it's absolutely not fine if they need to access these funds and spend from this wallet, let's say, once a day. Because mm -hmm. you're not going to, uh, to annoy five people every time you need to do a transaction. Uh, what if one person is sick? What if one person is on holidays? You know, things of like course. that. Yes. Um, and so multi-sig, to make it usable, the way it's implemented today in most businesses, including Unchained and the others, um, is usually a two out of three. So mm -hmm. you only need two people to access the funds. And when we're talking about like a hundred million dollar worth, um, I mean, imagine like if you need just to corrupt two people mm. to get a hundred million dollar, I mean, the criminals just would be like super happy. It's super cheap <laughs> to just, you know, threaten two people and get a hundred million dollar that can become, you know, pretty much untraceable um, after a few hops and some effort. So we are fixing this problem um, that no one is fixing until now. At least no one, you know, had the technology to fix. Yeah, in a practical way, in a way that, you know, doesn't completely kill the usability because security and, us and usability are really related. If you have mm. a very, very secure thing that is absolutely nightmare to use, people are not going to use it well. They are going of to course. try to bypass it all the time. And so, yeah, that's... Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So Antoine is saying, yeah, there have been research uh, done so far. Um, we are not the, we were not the first research project around covenants and around, you know, a different type of a uh, multi-sig, uh, but absolutely none of them were built in a practical way, and most of them also required uh, changes in Bitcoin. And as you might know, changing Bitcoin yeah, it's not, not easy, of course, and it's definitely so, not easy. So, as far sorry, as far as I understand, you're saying uh, you have to build uh, a second layer. Do you want to talk about that? Yes, so um, it's hard to say if it's a second layer or not. Uh, let's say it's another layer. <laughs> <laughs> All the security of our protocol is done by the Bitcoin blockchain. So okay. um, everything is somewhat, well, it's, yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're using a like, pre-signed transaction to enforce um, the conditions, basically. So if a problem happens, we can push a pre-signed transaction um, to, re like, to revoke a transaction. So that's what we call the, the project Revolt. Um, it allows you to cancel a transaction and put it back where it was. Um, after you can see a spending happening. So if you see a spending happening that looks weird or is out of, you know, normal policy, um, you can, you know, cancel it, which is a new thing. In Bitcoin, you don't have a cancel transaction. Um, now, of course, you don't really want people to be checking all the time, all the spending condition and see if there is a problem. So we also want to automate all of this with something that we call watchtowers. Um, they were like somewhat invented around the, the Lightning Network uh, projects. Because in Lightning, you have some kind of the same issue. You kind of have to watch if the other guy is not closing the channel um, in an adversarial way. Um, so for us, it's kind of the same. We have an automated um, like bunch of towers that are just watching the spending 
transactions. And if one of them is out of policy, it gets canceled basically. So the funds are not gone. They are going back to the initial vault. Okay. Um, but yeah, so what else can I say about the layer? Settlement once in a while to allow for this. N no, actually, no, we don't have channels. Um, uh, you so do the way everything works, on chain? Yeah. We do everything on yeah. chain. Yes, every okay. single thing is done on chain. Yeah, we have nothing off chain. So that's why we are not really yet happy okay. with the wording around around layers. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We have some part of the logic that is off chain, but all the transactions are on chain, which okay. is uh, what interesting. What is the deterrence uh, actually uh, off chain? The, that the deterrence part that is off chain. All right. Yeah, yeah. So the, yeah, the deterrence part is off chain, meaning there is a lot of um, things that can happen. Um, that would completely prevent an attack from happening. Just because the outcome of an attack is just so low to succeed, if not in existence, um, it removes the risk of an attack in the first place. Okay. But where where is this off-chain then? <laughs> is it another chain? It, it's a complicated uh, <laughs> architecture. So no, 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 there is no other chain. So okay. this is, a, this is a, a protocol that doesn't use third parties. So... Let's let's explain it from, a, let's say we are a company, right? So we are all stakeholders in a company. Let's say we are the shareholders. Um, our company is like a hedge fund. And we have a few hundred million dollars that we sometimes trade. Sometimes we keep some in a cold storage or whatever. And uh, we still need access to it in a quite fast way in case we need to, you know, trade or we need to move them somewhere. Um, so... We somewhat don't really want all of us, let's say we are five, we don't all want the five of us to be there all the time because we might be in different time zones yes. or we might you know, not be always on the computer. Um, some of us might not be technical people and might just be you know, some of the finance guys and we barely know how to use a Bitcoin wallet. Sure. Uh, so we could do big mistakes and spend too much money or waste uh, or lose 100 million or whatever. Um, so the Revolt protocol lets you delegate your spending um, rights, let's say. So you will have people that can be spenders or what we call managers in our architecture. Um, it could be one person even. So that could be just like the CFO or even an external person, a trader that you trust or you don't trust actually even. <laughs> so you give them the right to move your coins, right? But through the setup of the um, vault architecture at the beginning, um, so there is a setup between the five stakeholders, the five of us. So we generate, you know, private keys. We discuss the policies we want to put in place, like, you know, maybe time of the day, amount per week that can be spent, where the money can move. Maybe we want a white list of exchanges and the money cannot move elsewhere. Um, you know, all of these things we can, uh, we can decide. And then the system gets set up. So there is a lot of machines. Uh, there is, you know, watchtowers. There is a few bunch of servers that the company controls, right? We control. Um, there is no third party in this. Um, so you get that running and then, okay, how deep do I go in the details? <laughs> <laughs> how deep so then, do you want to go? <laughs> so basically then when we receive a transaction, we receive a transaction to a multi-sig uh, address. So what we call a deposit address or a vault address for now in our protocol is basically just a multi-sig. So in this example, it would be a five of five uh, multi-signature, all right? So all five of us need to sign to move the funds. Now, because these five people are not assumed to know about you know, Bitcoin or to want to do the day-to-day -day transactions, what they are doing is actually just pre-signing a transaction. So they're all signing a transaction that is following a certain template um, and they give this pre-signed transaction to the manager. The manager is the person who can spend, right? It's not necessarily one of the company. It could be a, an external person. Then this external, so this, also, yeah, this pre-signed transaction will enforce um, something we call a time lock in Bitcoin, meaning that um, the way we're using it is, uh, is called the check sequence verify. So when this pre-signed transaction will be pushed to the blockchain and mined, um, the output of this transaction, so basically the UTXO, if you know what it is, uh, cannot be spent for a certain amount of time or a certain amount of blocks. In our case, we use the amount of blocks. So as an example, we can say uh, six blocks. Okay. So why we do that um, is for really technical reasons. I don't really want to go into the details. 
But also this time lock will let us a window to cancel the transaction if we see something going wrong. So the manager, the person who can spend the money, let's say the trader, wants to do a transaction. He wants to move money to Kraken. He's going to craft a spending transaction from this pre-signed transaction output to Kraken. He's going to try to push it on the blockchain, um, but because of the way Bitcoin works, he cannot right now. First, he has to push the pre-signed transaction, so he gets mined. mined. Uh, then he needs to wait like the six blocks, for example, of the time lock, and then the spending transaction can happen. But the thing is, during these six blocks, um, our system of watchtowers or any of the stakeholders of the five people at the beginning uh, can push another transaction, which we call a cancel transaction, that will send the funds immediately back to the initial place, so to the five out of five uh, multi-sig. And so the spender couldn't, like, cannot move the funds. So of course you trigger that only when you are out of policy. So if it's like sending money to Kraken, it should be fine because probably the address of Kraken is whitelisted by the fund. But if the guy is trying to send all the money to his pocket, it will be caught by the, by the system of watchtowers and they will push this console transaction that will then move all the funds back to the vaults. Um, so the logic of these watchtowers is actually off chain, obviously. Um, so that's what is off chain. Um, but all the, you know, time locks and all of these things is an uh, on chain enforced. I have a question. Um, in that, uh, time space that you have six blocks, uh, if at that time the mempool is full, can you have some trouble to, on the watchtowers trying to put the transaction on chain? Yes, the, that is like the, the biggest problem in Bitcoin right now is mempool management. So it's the same yeah. problem for Lightning and all of these things. Uh, so for us, of course, it's critical. Um, we need these pre-signed transactions to have a very smart uh, fee bumping mechanism. So we need to be able to make sure the transaction will go through, uh, like the console transaction will go through during the time lock. Um, so we need to be able to increase the fees in case, you know, the, the transaction fee increase during this time. Um, yeah, we basically they need to have the highest priority. We need to make sure it will go through. Yes. Um, but it's really hard to do in Bitcoin because there is a lot of ways to uh, do something called transaction pinning, which is basically preventing the transaction to be, to be mined. Um, and that would be a vector of attack against us. So yes, we have systems against that. Um, but they are really complex, and I think we are probably one of the team, uh, one of the few, very few teams on the planet really working on this. Like, it's so critical for us that we need to find proper solutions for this. Well, and I'm pretty fine. sure that uh, the solution that you find can also benefit uh, other, you know, other projects working on different Bitcoin protocols. Yeah, it depends. Um, it depends because, like, all of the, let's say, so it would really benefit for other, um, like, layers but it really depends on the use case so yeah okay. lightning and stuff are very different in the way they operate for example for lightning we can't use our solution which is basically to introduce media ability in the conciliation transaction so we introduce media ability for ourselves so we can uh, attach new input in order to burn the fees but it would not be a particle for lightning network because you have second stage transactions that are relying on this present transaction so you can't introduce media ability on this one or the next one down the separate chains are going to be invalid. On the other hand, Lightning is going to use anchor outputs, which works because it's only for two parties channels. Uh, our protocol is designed for multi parties, so we can't use okay. anchor outputs because we can't use the carve out. Yeah. So the, yeah, there are, there are like things that are working for Lightning because it's two parties right now. Mm -hmm. um, and our system is more than two parties that, so, Let's say the hacks or the tricks they are using, we can't use the same. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And probably you have uh, more vet vectors of attack uh, because you're working with more parties. So I'm just assuming that. Um, the, do you guys have any, any other comments, by the way? Uh, on our side, yeah. I mean, like the, the main thing I think that I didn't really say um, around what we are offering and the difference between every other solution um, is that we are not only covering the risk from an online attacker. Um, because for the amount of money we are trying to cover, like we're trying to cover basically any amount of money. So we are also looking, especially looking at um, real world attacks, um, as in, you know, 
physical threats, um, as in employee collusion, mm -hmm. as in some of the stakeholder colluding with each other to steal the money from the fund. And, you know, it, like we're looking at really, really crazy stuff. Um, so yeah, we're really trying to include every type of, um, of real world attack that could happen, uh, for big amount of money that would justify, you know, going crazy. So if you were a really big criminal organization and, uh, you know, you can, you can steal half a billion dollar, um, by just threatening some people, we need to cover that risk. And right now the companies that are offering multi-sig are not covering this risk. They are just covering the risk of one key leaking or something. Okay. Um, we are going to cover the risk up to all but one key leaking. So let's say if, they, if it's a group of 10 people, you can leak nine keys and it still works at Revolt. So this is pretty insane. And That's yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, I mean, okay, so I have, uh, I mean, this, this might sound a bit uh, of a strange question, but, uh, um, I think it, it's going to be a fun one. So let's say, okay, imagine that, you know, the revolve protocol is implemented and, uh, you know, it's already live and companies are using it. How do you envision, like, you know, that for, like, that future for the usability of Bitcoin for corporations? Do you think that it'll, it will attract more companies? Do you think it will, well, what do you think it will, it will do? So we really believe that it's so much better for companies than anything in place that everyone will use it. Um, maybe not Revolt Revolt, at least maybe not um, our specific implementation, but we do really believe that this will become some kind of a standard, at least in the way of thinking um, around custody for, for companies and, and multi-party situations. So okay. right now in custody, uh, there are... There are, or at least there seems to be a lot of uh, interest in solutions that offer um, MPC. Do you have something that you can discuss with us about it? Multi-party computation? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, we don't because we don't want to play too much with uh, new cryptography stuff. Uh, we don't really want to add more risk. We have enough to cover with Bitcoin and with, you know, networking and all of this stuff. So looking around, you know, multi-party computation, looking around multi-party um, digital signatures, there is a lot of new things that are really fun, but we don't want to work with them because they are adding more assumptions or, yeah, like all of these new stuff keep getting, you know, flaws and you keep finding new attacks and things. And yeah, there are edge cases that. that have not been tested and they are being added onto those platforms and those protocols. Well, yeah. yeah, that's always a risk. So definitely that's, yeah, for us, that's something, uh, something important. Another thing is that we want our architecture to work with Bitcoin today. So we are not expecting any change in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Of course, okay. we're welcoming change to Bitcoin. <laughs> so if there is change or when there is change, like, uh, you know, Schnorr signatures and things like that, um, great. But we don't need them for Revolt to work today. And that's also very important because most of the other protocols um, that are being researched or developed, um, always have, you know, some need for different kind of inputs or, mm -hmm. you know, different kind of logic around Bitcoin. And our goal is really to make it practical from Bitcoin that exists today. But I'm curious, by the way, is there like any, any, any upgrade that would be very like super useful for you guys? Uh, not that you need, but one that, you know, um, that, that would actually help a lot. You yes. Just say, uh, because you mentioned Snore, so I'm not, I'm not sure if Snore uh, is something else. Um, yeah, today we, uh, we were basically focusing on one specific type of thing that is annoying for us um, with the mempool. And um, we all the solutions we have are okay and probably would be, you know, enough for years. Mm -hmm. But we cannot prove that there won't be a Black Swan event triggering a very specific condition. It's okay. not a security risk. It's a usability pain, basically. Uh, around the mempool and so yeah that's uh, that's packaging transactions uh, in terms of fees and right now it's not implemented to bitcoin and i think it would really help but for snow and stuff yeah great but we don't need it we really okay. like yeah could be could be fun in terms of like fungibility and things but otherwise uh, it I think could be a, a huge cost reduction as well oh yeah if yeah using that route but we don't want to introduce not yet mm -hmm. maybe in five years yeah, so yeah, ter term of, in terms of costs, um, so right now for us, it's not really a concern because we are kind of looking at, you know, big amount of money. So paying fees that are a few euros worth um, is perfectly fine for most of our uh, potential clients, right? Okay. Um, but yeah, sure, using Snow or something like that would really reduce mm. the cost because the scripts we're using are pretty big and we're using quite a few transaction chain, like a chain of transactions, basically, of pre-signed transactions. So we have to pay multiple fees 
um, to get a transaction from coming into the fund to where it's supposed to go. Um, it's like three transactions. So yeah. Is there, for example, any update to the CSV opcode that could be interesting for you guys? Um, no, not okay. as far as I know. No. Okay. Cool. Do you guys have a client yeah. already using the system? Nope. So right now, um, so we have an architecture, right? Okay. Uh, we've been yeah, yeah. working yeah. on an implementation. So we started working on the implementation and we basically gave ourselves the goal of uh, doing it in one year, uh, including, you know, audits, like security audits um, and things like that, because it's a security product. So we can't really do a, you know, a very short implementation MVP and just uh, give it to uh, banks and be like, hey, it's secure. Mm -hmm. um, so it will take time to develop a, a secure implementation. Right now we're working on a, um, a client and, you know, I would say clients even because, you know, you would need to code the watchtowers, the different servers, the wallets, everything. Uh, we're working on, uh, on that with, uh, REST, which is a pretty cool programming language. Um, also, it's not really easy to find REST developers. Um, so that's one of the things that is slowing us down a little bit. But for the long term, it's just going to be so useful that uh, it makes sense. So the probably the first clients we will get um, are going to be before the middle of next year, because that's when we should have a working product. Um, and we will probably, you know, scale um, by the yeah by the end of next year. Okay. Nice. Well, so that's good to know. It's not uh, that far away. In, I would be really uh, in the terms of a... I would be really interested to see a comparison of your product to the, for example, yeah, well, basically to any other, uh, let's say, non-custodial uh, custody solution. Something yeah, so... like I was saying, for example, something like Curve that uses MPC. Uh, I would like to see a, a comparison of both. It would be interesting, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so um, something I could add here um, is that there is a difference between key management, which is already, you know, like a very big thing in security. So using multi-sig or, you know, multi-party computation, things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, yeah, there is a lot of things for key management that exist. But key management is not enough because if you corrupt um, some of the people, you can get access to their keys, right? So for it sure. might be very hard to steal bitcoin from like a online perspective if you know you get access to one computer or whatever then you're like oh no i need another key to do the multi-sig and stuff like that uh, but in our case you can even come to my house threaten my family i can give you my key it will not let you spend the coins because we have the entire automated way of checking that the funds are not going outside of the system so you know you can't add your uh, your public key there. It's, it's not, it's not going to go to your address. The, the system is just watching for it. Um, sure. even if you corrupt everyone. So this is really different. Um, we're going much further than just, um, just know. key management. It's not yes. just key management. It's definitely not just key management. No, no. Okay. Good. For I think, yeah, it would be, uh, I mean, a big problem if you can, if you can just like, you know, threaten somebody who has access to a, to a master, to, to, to a master key and just, they, they can just use it. So basically that, 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 that's a big issue, even for like, you know, any other type of system. Yeah, uh, but he's not the... even talking of just uh, someone that has a master key. He's talking about even in a multi-party setup, if yeah. you threaten several people, sure. you cannot make the transaction. Exactly. So that is really interesting in the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. The thing that I understand, you have two transactions, right? Well, uh, we you... have a few. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, the, okay. Their, their problem is that they don't have just one or two. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I think um, one thing I, I found funny, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto solved the double spend problem. You guys put it on, on play again. <laughs> You can uh, say that actually, actually somewhat, yeah. We are we are adding double spend, but uh, it's not a bad double spend, you know. It's yes, a, yes, yes. I'm spend kidding. Spend is never authorized in the first place. Exactly. That's nice. That's nice. It's good to have the, that kind of uh, of options. Uh, yeah, and uh, if you want some like real world example to give you an idea of really what we're fixing, because it's not, you know, it's not really a a thing for normal users. Um, but for example, if you look at, you know, the mess around BitMEX recently, um, people were scared about, you know, where is the money at BitMEX going to go, um, you know, if uh, if the founders are arrested or something. 
and uh, BitMEX is actually secured through a two out of three multi-sig as well. So you just need two of the three co-founders to take all of the money from BitMEX, just to give you an idea of how mad the level of security in Bitcoin is today. You just need to get two of the people and you can get all of the money out. This is, it, it just makes no sense. We're talking about billions of dollars worth. Um, and this is the best security that exists in Bitcoin today. Well, I'm sorry, but it really needs mm. to be. But it, it's not just the two of three, right? Because, I mean, I'm going to get, this is just a guess, but they should probably have some processes in place that if two of them get arrested or whatever, they have some kind of, I don't know, but policing system that will uh, warn other stakeholders in the company. And even if they are not the top management, they would not, uh, I don't know, but sign the transaction, give access to the system that signs the transactions, whatever that, that is. I can't, I can't believe that they would be so naive as to have only a two of three multi-seek protecting their, all of their funds. But that's the reality today. And that's, that's what happened in all exchanges and all of these funds. It's crazy. Of course, they have extra policies, but these policies cannot be enforced. So you go back to the same square, you know, you threaten them so they don't, you know, call their friends or whatever and saying, oh no, uh, we have a problem. Uh, but no, no, we are talking about three keys. And three people have one key each, and you just need two people to sign a transaction and push it. And Bitcoin, Bitcoin network, the Bitcoin network is the only, you know, judge of that. There is no, there is no existing way of canceling a transaction. So if two people sign, oh, and for sure, the what, Bitcoin what I, network, it's gone. Yeah, for sure. What I'm saying is that they, in my opinion, they must have some, some other system that will prevent them from even signing a, a massive transaction or whatever. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me that that would be even broadcasted if it was the case. Yeah, it could be with like the software they're using or something for sure, yeah. But you could yeah. still import the key somewhere else and, and do it, bypass the software, right? So it's just it's just a software thing. It's, a, it's not very strong. Sure. I, I agree that you are going above and beyond. Uh, I'm yeah. just saying, I, I don't, I cannot believe that they would be that night in yeah, my opinion. And, uh, and there is worse case, like you can look at the Bitcoin. For sure. And, uh, I mean, and you worse case, they're always. Using just one thing, and it's just insane. Like cold storage mm -hmm. on one single address is just mad, and a lot of people are doing <laughs> that. Uh, I mean, for sure. I mean, there are still so many exchanges using legacy addresses that basically you don't even have uh, Bitcoin security there. It's Maybe they do have multi-party security, but it's on a different software. And that's what I mean. I mean, beyond having the three keys, they should also have some kind of software like that. And the the example that comes to my mind was Coinbase up to uh, not that long ago. And uh, even, I mean, even blockchain.com or whatever, but they don't hold the keys. So that's not really a good example. But yeah, an exchange that still uses legacy addresses would would be more vulnerable to that kind of attacks if it was just one address, one key. Exactly. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you guys are uh, working only for Bitcoin, or do you want to implement this system in in, uh, in other blockchains? In uh, yeah, Bitcoin maximalists here. Uh, yeah. Bitcoin only. <laughs> Then you, care about Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, you not consider that at all? No, um, and uh, the actual reason why is um, maybe a little bit different, um, is that we want to offer some kind of guarantee to our users um, that, you know, we're really, we're really working on a, on a system that is secure. Um, and so we really rely on our work, but also on the security of the Bitcoin blockchain um, to actually follow what it's supposed to do when there is, you know, time locks and checking the signatures and stuff. Um, and Bitcoin is really, really the only blockchain where you have a ton of efforts into making sure things work and we don't add new things that could break it. Um, it's, it's just so much effort into that, that we pretty much rely that the, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain is not going to fuck us over so we can add our security on top. Um, if we're talking about, for example, Ethereum or something like that, 
I'm sure we could do our system in a much easier way from the development perspective because, you know, smart contracts and everything. But then we have to rely on Ethereum to actually do the job properly. And this is just so much out of our control um, that, yeah, uh, any, <laughs> any bug happening or whatever, that would come back to us because we're the guys selling the solution. Um, and we are like, we have no control over whatever happened. Okay. Yeah, especially with, when it migrates to POS. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> and, Vitalik uh, yeah. will save you, man. Vitalik will save you. If you, you will fight for it. <laughs> yeah. So on this point, um, yeah, so any kind of like blockchain funny stuff like rolling block back or even, you know, hash rate type attacks, um, we know Bitcoin is the one with the most money spent um, in terms of, uh, of security <laughs> blockchain. And so for us, it's uh, another guaranteed security because our system rely only on, well, not only, but really relies on the time lock to be respected. So if you start being able to push transactions around in the blockchain and, and roll back blocks and stuff, um, oh my God, that would be really bad. Uh, or any form of censorship. Like if you can censor the cancel transaction, um, yeah, it, it would be really bad for us. So we really, really need the blockchain to work like clockwork and always yeah, work as expected. <laughs> Yeah, especially for your customers. I mean, if you sell, if you're selling them a solution that uh, that doesn't work after all, especially like you know, if it's custody, I mean, yeah, they, it does. It does make sense that you only only work with the uh, at least the the best uh, the best solution that there is in the market. Um, I, I actually have a question a bit outside the revolt, but that might be very useful for our listeners because I mean, Kevin is is kind of like an expert in in security. So do, do, do you have like any advice that you want to give like, you know, to people that are you know, coming now to Bitcoin or that are not um, experts in the security aspects of Bitcoin or can they like, you know, manage their coins? Yeah, uh, it's really hard. Um, seriously, <laughs> like they will do mistakes, like new, new users will do mistakes. Um, that's just something you can't avoid. So the first thing I would say is just buy a hardware wallet, um, you know, buy it directly from the manufacturer, not from Amazon, not from eBay. You go really at the manufacturer, you buy a hardware wallet. Um, then if you really want to do things properly, you should do some research before plugging your hardware wallet because all of the hardware wallet companies or pretty much all of them today um, are going to get access to what we call your XPUB, like your public key. Um, and so they might be somewhat spying on you in terms of like how much money you have and you don't know who is going to get access to this information. Um, mm -hmm. So if you want to have some form of privacy and, you know, I'm, I'm taking this word lightly because privacy on Bitcoin is really hard. Um, so if you want to have some form of uh, at least, yeah, pseudonymity, you should not use the software provided by your hardware wallet manufacturer. Um, so you should put some effort into it, probably run a full node, probably look into, you know, how Electrum works and the different things around it, like Electrum personal servers and things like that. It takes some time, but it's really worth it. And if you don't have time, at least, you know, buy a hardware wallet before buying Bitcoin. Um, I think. And I would say also just to emphasize, but maybe, <laughs> uh, switch some on, on something that you just said. If you don't have the time, do use the Hardware wallets provide their software. Don't search for other wallet softwares out there. This that will be only for advanced users that yeah, do yeah. know what they are doing. Please do not do that. <laughs> oh yeah, very minimum. Uh, get a hardware wallet, and uh, if you have time, you know, look into other things like other you know software stack on top of your hardware wallet. But uh, yeah, the hardware wallet itself will help uh, securing your coin. It will not offer you any form of privacy whatsoever, but at least you know, your coin are much more secure than anywhere else uh, on your computer, on your phone or whatever. Okay. That's good advice. Um, yeah, but I think at least most, most of the, most of the, the, the people that I know that are coming to Bitcoin, they, they already have uh, some sort of, you know, hardware wallet or, or at least they've, they've heard of it. So they, at least they've asked. So uh, they're aware of it. I hope they're using them. Um, uh, do you have, uh, yeah. You're kind of wrong, but okay. You, you think so? Let's, let's go. Yeah. No one has hardware wallets. And when I say no one, is like most people that come into Very Bitcoin, yeah. they don't have hardware wallets. I well, think yeah, that I mean, when they, the money you are Bitcoin, but, uh, but loads of people that I've been talking to, honestly, they 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 know, or at least they have hardware wallets. At least they've, that's what they've been they, they, that's what that's what they've been told in, telling me. Oh. Yes, yeah, sure. Maybe if they <laughs> already have enough funds to worry about that, 
but I can tell you that there are a lot of people both coming in and both already in the market that uh, they don't even worry about that and they still use mobile wallets and for everything. Sure, but I mean, but yeah, but, yeah, really different wallet. exchanges and stuff. Yeah, but that's sure. But th those guys, you can just like you know, you cannot help because they don't care about that, <laughs> for sure. Do you, yeah, sure. Yeah. Do you guys have any any other questions for Kevin? By the way, about Revolt, I, I think not. I think I I got what they are doing. It's very nice. I hope you guys can provide your service as soon as possible. It's look uh, promiser. Or uh, is <laughs> promising. Yeah. Promising. My English is awesome. <laughs> it's great. Much much better than my Portuguese. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need to talk, to teach you some words, man. I, I already teach one uh, when we <laughs> were off. A very good one, indeed. <laughs> we must use it. Yeah. Proceed. Um... No, I was just saying that. Um, I mean, uh, just to, to uh, perhaps just to you know to end the the show, um, we just have some news that we you, because Kevin usually we we discussed we discuss some some news that we see during the week, and uh, I've picked up something that's related to Bitcoin that I I think it can be interesting, which is the fact that um, uh, a new type of uh, marketplace for payment uh, channels has emerged in the Lightning Network. Um, I'm not sure if you heard, but basically. Um, at least uh, the guy, the guy who wrote that, was calling it a bit like uh, like DeFi, or it it allows you to to do some uh, some lending over the Lightning Network. Um, do uh, do you think that that's interesting? Yeah, I mean, some of uh, some of like one of my guy <laughs> here is uh, is really interested in this. Uh, I'm I'm not actually personally too fond of um, of like you know using Lightning Network for important stuff because it's not really secure yet. Sure, but, um, but it's working, so yeah, it's exciting. Cool. What about you guys? Well, or, it's, uh... yeah, it's a start. I mean, it's needed for for the for the Lightning Network to to evolve uh, to create the let's say the the network that they that is needed for the for the clients to operate there. Uh, it's an important step to have a, a marketplace. Um, for uh, for fees and for whatever services you are offering, I think it's a really nice it's a really nice uh, start. Yes, yeah, so it's a very good starting point. I agree. I agree. I hope it evolves uh, and they can you know start doing like you know more things <laughs> because uh, yeah, that's I think that that's going to be very good for the ecosystem for the Bitcoin ecosystem. Sure, it will. Kevin. Are you there? Still there? Yeah, I am. I am. Still with us. <laughs> do you do you remember uh, your pizza day? Mm -hmm. uh, in what or uh, when did you spend uh, Bitcoin the first time? Oh wow! Um, mm. um, <laughs> I think it. Yeah, my okay. I don't remember the first time I spent some Bitcoin, but um, in real life, I know it was a beer um, in a in a bar in Dublin. Um, that was 2013, so yeah, pretty, pretty. How much thousand dollars did you spend on that beer? <laughs> um, thousands, maybe not, but um, probably like a hundred or so, yeah. <laughs> uh, Anthony is there. He he can can uh, answer the same question. Yeah, what well, was the question I was going for? <laughs> <the last word. laughs> I I was asking Kevin the pizza day. Where did you spend your Bitcoin first time? In what? Oh, I don't remember. I remember first time I made transactions, which was basically hacking around with the Bitcoin related softwares, but I don't remember first time I spent some to an actual store or something. <laughs> okay. okay. There's something you, we need, guys. we need to discuss yet on the, with Kevin? Um, no, I think that's it. I think I got all the questions that I have here. Yeah. Okay. Where don't you ask? Don't you want to ask about the the other news that you posted in the afternoon? Uh, what other news? Can you, yeah, yeah, go for Multi it. I don't, I don't yeah. Know. yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, but go for it, go for right. it. Hitler. So basically, there are news that the Portuguese central bank is uh, trying or studying enforcement of using uh, credit cards or debit cards and yep. MBA on uh, businesses and restaurants. 
basically yeah, well, I, I don't really know how, how this would work. So it would be stupid because small businesses cannot. Not all small businesses can take the fees of using exactly. of exactly. accepting payments like that. So uh, are the fees still high? I have no idea. Yes, they the are fees. very high. Do you think that uh, with the, they would try to you know um, to compensate the the you know the businesses for the fees some, somehow? I mean, I, I still don't agree. I think it's really stupid. But do you think that they will try at least they'll think of that or not even if that? if they are thinking of doing it, they would have to make uh small businesses not pay fees at all exactly yeah. it, i mean Absolutely. it would have to be the solution like you would have to scale it if you are a very small business do not pay fees or have some other fee schedule uh with your bank with your uh tpa provider but i mean it's very impractical it's very well, they they can they can force them away and uh, the, the 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 small business only have to have the phone, and if there are any fees, it's on the customer. That will probably solve the problem of the small business. No, it's a workaround. Uh, I'm just uh, thinking out loud. Yeah, I guess it's a workaround. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't make sense either. You know, uh, it, it's it's uh, it's just an invasion of privacy. It makes no sense, to be honest. Um, it's like Kiko was telling us that uh, on Spain, it's uh, absolutely uh, normal. Everyone uses credit card, right, Kiko? Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe the the major difference is that uh, on Spain you have more uh, competition on the TPA systems. Yeah, I, I believe that. I don't know. <laughs> No, yeah, actually, yeah, you you yeah, have already talked about cash, that, didn't right? you, Kiko? Because yeah. uh, on there was a, some time ago you said that the banks even have different payment systems, uh, so they they do not all share the same payment system like we do in Portugal with fees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you have fees uh, depending on where you're. Yeah. So. And... Yeah. Exactly. So. Uh, I think the system is so different. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know either. I don't know. We know what they are trying to force. They are trying to exactly. to take uh, physical money out of the circulation. Everyone uses something that they can control. I believe that's the the where they are where they want to go. Yeah, that's the end goal. But uh, sure. I mean, whatever. Let them study. Yes, it's, they will it's, not uh, be able to to enforce that. <laughs> there will be a lot of public outcry on that. Yeah, for that sure. sure, 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 sure. Uh, I, I agree. That is something that I don't see the the public uh, accepting lightly. So, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I think the general customer they don't care about uh, their data. Uh, probably the the most. Oh no, um, they don't no, care. Not about the data. Yeah. The yes, yes, yes. Probably the the most uh, difficult to accept was the small business, like you were talking. Yeah. But they, they will just get some kind of uh, easy way to that to accept or paying less fees or pay no fees. No, but to, to be honest, but if, if you really think about it, let's say okay, let, let's imagine they have a, like a, a wee coffee shop, right? A small coffee shop. I mean, if they tell me, okay, you need to put a TPA in there, okay, and they, they give me the TPA, they put it in there, but they cannot force me to use it, right? I can just turn exactly. it off and exactly. not use it and don't give a fuck, right? I mean, that's an option. So uh, I think that's what probably will happen. Even if they try to enforce it, it's not going to be easy to enforce. Exactly. Uh, you, you can have TPA, but when you want to use it, uh, you only can use on some amount of money. That already happens. A lot of yeah, places yeah, only sure. accept uh, more than five euros. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, but but it's a stupid law anyway. So it's uh, it's a uh, yeah a stupid idea. But, <laughs> yeah, it's not a law. It's a stupid, law, whatever. It's sorry. just yeah. a stupid idea. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Kevin? Um. All right. So for me, it's a little bit different. My um, I I don't like coins. So for me, it's a different thing. I just hate coins. If we only had banknotes, like uh, in the U.S., you know. Uh, Having a one euro banknote would be great mm -hmm. because uh, having coins in my pocket, I just hate the feeling. Yeah, um, sure. So if if I can, I pay by card. Uh, I know it's bad for my privacy, and I should not. 
but uh, it's just quality of life. I don't like my pocket full of coins. Sure. Um, <laughs> now, on the on the fee perspective, the the fees are not really that high. Um, it's really a misconception in Europe. Uh, in the US, it is yes, but in Europe, it's extremely regulated, and they they cannot do whatever they want with the fees. So, for, as an example, for example, um, like if you want to accept, you know, a payment of like two euros um, on a TPA, you're probably gonna end up paying less than ten cents of transaction fees. Uh, of course, that's like five percent. It might it might sound like a lot, but seriously, ten cents on two euros um, can't really call that very expensive, and it's probably less than ten cents right now. So we're not talking about, you know, 50 cents or 60 cents and all the shops that put like, you know, 10 euro minimum to accept card. It's probably that they are afraid of the fee, but the fee is not high. The fee is just a percentage based. Um, there is pretty much no uh, minimum amount now in Europe. So it's really a percentage. It doesn't matter how uh, how small the payment is. Um, mm, and on top of that, you pay some think kind of a you're right. fee. I don't Where? think you're right. It depends on the provider. There are providers mm -hmm. that charge yeah. a, fl a flat fee and then a percentage fee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So typically, yeah, that would be the case. You would have a you would have a rental at, fee every at month. At least in Portugal, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that would be you know it's, it's not a big amount. Um, the rental fee, I don't know, it's like no, but maybe not, fifteen euro a month or something at Novomenko, and then you would get like. Two but or three I'm not percent. even talking about the rental fee. I'm talking per payment. Mm -hmm. Usually, there's a flat fee right. per payment, and then the percentage the amount. Yeah. So. Not that often. Okay. You can check it out. I, yeah. You are poor, man. You are in Portugal. I'm actually you going to check that out right now because... Okay. We're going to wait for you. <laughs> man, we are, we are poor in Portugal, man. Ten cents can give you two, two gums. <laughs> yeah. Well, it means I don't that know how much for coffee, but for a two euro coffee, I'm, I'm quite sure and the fee is like pretty much non-existent. <laughs> two euro coffee where? At the blood back in the days. <laughs> That's a steal, man. Not when the coffee is good. <laughs> uh, Kevin, I, I know I know you are a Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, you are talking with two uh, Monero maximalists, me <laughs> and Kiko. What do you think about Monero? Um, I have a four-letter word in my head, but um, let's say... <laughs> um, Go ahead, man. I mean, no. I mean, what can I even say about it? I mean... What what's what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. You you are really only Bitcoin, only for Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, even Bitcoin, I'm not uh, I'm not that enthusiastic about it. Like I, I see all the flaws possible. So to me, it's it, it's all pretty bad. It's just that Bitcoin is much much better than the other bad things. So. Actually, he is a credit card maximalist. I'm a credit card maximalist. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, damn it. So, so yeah, for me, like it, it really, I, I, I'm okay with research, right? So I'm perfectly fine with people trying things and experimenting things, uh, whatever, if they want to create other chains or whatever, but trying to sell it as like a payment method or whatever, or privacy or anything. I mean, this is just, no, just no, um, it, it doesn't work like that. But I'm curious, by, by the way, and how do, how do you see Bitcoin as money? I mean, do you like it as, as, as money technology? Uh, do you think that it will achieve, like, you know, a, a store of value purpose at some point in its history? I mean, it already is a store of value in some way. Sure, sure. I mean, for us, yeah, but for most people, I mean, for most people, you just, just see it as, like, you know, a, 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 like a normal asset that's, like, with loads of volatility, right? Sure. Uh, yeah, it is volatile. Um, yeah, sure, of yeah. course. Cool. Um, I don't believe anytime soon we will have any form of... A, Scalability on top of Bitcoin, at least at uh, at layer one. So I don't believe uh, it will ever be a you know uh, um, medium of exchange. Yeah. Global money that replaces every system. System. Yeah, that that's just not happening. At least not on the on the on the main layer. Um, yeah. So that's one thing. Um, now I do really see it as a better money than other existing money. So. It really makes sense to hold as an asset, either you know, store value or for very high value transactions. Yeah, it's just it's just shocking, like the amount of you know fees you have to pay in the traditional banking system, especially if you need to do conversions between currencies. Mm -hmm. um, it's insane to have you know to deal with like, oops, we don't know where the money is. It might come you know tomorrow or the day after. Um, when you use the interbank system, it's like that, and it's still like that. 
it's insane to know that a country can just devaluate its currency by just like one or two guys deciding it. So there is just a lot of risks in the traditional system uh, that Bitcoin doesn't really have. Um, and just that is enough to, to give it a lot of value. Um, now, is this a store of value? I mean, sure, but that's really a different problem there. It, it's more like a good money thing, um, but not a currency yeah. as in like doing payments for uh, buying my uh, my bread in the morning, right? Mm -hmm, exactly, because I mean, Bitcoin can can be used as a store of value. Like, for example, if a bank would say that uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna hold my reserves in Bitcoin, right? Um, I mean, that they, they could do it. So Bitcoin would be it, we would build it in that case as a store they of value. They will do it eventually. I, I think so. I think eventually they will do it eventually. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because it revolts because they cannot store it right now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they need to wait for revolt banks. Wait, guys, don't it's do it not in right their now. interest to do that, yeah. though, because they would then not be able to loan money. So, I mean, There's they would, be, they would still be able to loan money. I mean, no, they won't. If they don't have fractional reserve, they cannot make loans. No, no, I'm not saying they don't have fractional reserve. I'm saying that they can, they can hold their reserves in Bitcoin. I'm not saying that they should not do fractional reserve. So a bit of fractional uh... reserve makes sense. Okay. But, you know, a bit, a bit, but not, not like I mean, 90%, that's just, that's not fractional, reserve, that's gambling, that's different. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so, so I'm just going to say that I guess Kevin was more right than me. There is a, a minimum fee of 5 cents per transaction, but it is percentage based. 5%? No, 5 cents. I 5 cents, okay, okay. Yeah, 5 cents per transaction flat. Minimum. Okay. Okay, but then after some amount, you gonna pay some percentage. No? Yeah, it's zero point seventy five to zero point nine percent on okay. two places that I just two banks that I just saw. Uh, but okay. it does have a a minimum of only five cents. I actually thought the minimum was more. Mm -hmm. So okay. if it's less than one percent fee on top, that means that my two euro coffee would be like seven cents maximum. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So maybe we should uh, close the tavern. Yep. Sure. Uh, so let's uh, let's uh, yeah. uh, let's uh, let's just uh, teach a word to to Kevin. Go for it. Uh, can, can we go, Kevin? Can we? Can I teach you something? Go go go. When uh, we end the episode, you gonna try to say a day per a semana. It's All right. That sounds, that sounds fair. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, go ahead, Fubrakash. Um, so yeah, uh, I would like to thank you, thank you all, especially Kevin and Antoine for uh, for joining us today. Um, it was a really, really cool episode. Thank you a lot uh, for explaining what Revolt does. I think it's going to be a very cool protocol when it's uh, finished and uh, you know up and running. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I hope you had a good time, Kevin. And uh, yeah, I hope we can have you uh, some other day, some, uh, some some sometime in the future when uh, when revolt is uh, you know is uh, is done, and you can talk a bit more to us about it. Sure, I'd be happy to. Cool, mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. Yeah, and uh, thanks, guys. I'll see you next week. I would like uh, to thank uh, uh, the special thanks, of course, to uh, Luso Digital Assets for sponsoring sponsoring the, this episode, also to uh, Bition and uh, to uh, crypto nerds as well um, finally uh, a special thanks to the monero pool run by our people um, yeah thanks guys thanks you and uh, we will speak obrigado kevin até a próxima até a próxima semana <laughs> <laughs> nice thank you kevin okay.